anyway, we, we're in a series called It's Time to Build Again. I really feel the Lord gave me that topic uh, as I was praying about this new year, that this topic is, it's time to build again. And see, as we move into this new season at, at, in, in our church and in our church life, as we begin to build again, it's really, really important that we lay the proper foundations. That we, 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 If you don't build on the right foundations, you pay for it later on, right? I just, I just spent uh, over... Eight thousand dollars this last year on just the one wall of my garage. Uh, the rest of the house was built on great foundations, but the one wall was not built properly. The one foundation not built properly, and suddenly last year the one wall was starting to move and sink down into the ground, and my 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 garage roof was separating from the rest of my house. And uh, of course, the, you hire the people; they come in. It's an easy fix, but it's going to cost you eight thousand dollars, right? So, all because someone didn't lay a right foundation when the house was built. But the same is true in our lives. If we build our lives on the wrong, found, wrong foundations, we can survive for a while, but eventually we're going to pay the price. And so we've been looking at foundations of the church. And, and one of the first foundations I share with you is the, the importance of the house church. Uh, biblically, the house church, the small group, is the church. This is not the church. This is what we call the congregation, the congregating together of the people of God. But the early church, what it's the the primary, or what I want to say, that's not the right word. The 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 um, the foundational unit of the church was the house church. That's where the five purposes of the church were best fulfilled: worship, fellowship. Uh, discipleship, uh, um, ministry, and evangelism took place around the house church. And then vibrant house churches came together, congregated together like we're doing right now, and formed the uh, uh, congregation. And in the congregation, as we said last week, the primary purpose of the congregation was really only twofold. Number one, teaching and testifying like we're doing this afternoon, but then also coming together to worship and praise God and prayer to pray to God for three things, for, for uh, direction, for impartation, and for empowerment. And those really the three purpose or the two purposes of us getting together here is just teaching and receiving the power of God that we can go out and be the people of God with His power, with signs and wonders following. The Bible says, "Today I want to look at another foundation uh, that that you say, well, I already know this, but but I want to challenge you today. Actually, I'm going to stretch you, and I may even shock you for a minute or two as we go through this process. Do we really understand?" Salvation. Do we really understand what biblical salvation is? You know, I've been just so, um, I don't even know the right word, maybe frustrated or shocked or uh, uh, um, saddened by how many people say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a practicing Christian, and so it's okay for me to marry a non-practicing Muslim. And it's like, you can... <laughs> How can you say, well, I'm a, I'm a non-practicing Christian. I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. I don't pray. I don't acknowledge the existence of God. I don't follow him at all, but, but I'm still a Christian. I'm a non-practicing Christian. That's like saying, well, I'm a Boy Scout. I, I don't go to any of the meetings. I, I don't help little ladies across the street. You know, I don't do anything a Boy Scout should do. I'm a non-practicing Boy Scout. Or I'm a doctor, but I'm a non-practicing doctor. I don't, you know, I don't operate. I don't test anybody. I don't take any appointments. I'm a non-practicing. You know, if I got sick, I'm not going to go to a non-practicing doctor, right? I want one that knows who he is and he's doing what he is, right? Um, when you find one, let me know. Yeah, a good, a good, yeah, that's done practicing, knows his stuff now, right? Yeah. Uh, but in the same way, with, 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 do we understand salvation? Uh, do we really understand what it means to be a Christian? Do we, do, do, we, do we know how to experience biblical salvation? Do we know how to communicate to other people biblical salvation? Or have we turned, uh, and here's where it gets a little bit uncomfortable, have we turned salvation into a dead work? What, what I mean by that? 
See, most of us have been taught that in order to be saved, if you want to become a Christian, you just repent of your sins, turn to Jesus, and you'll be saved. Okay? Now, so we, we give them this little process to go through. Number one, you've got to acknowledge you're a sinner. Okay, well, I think most of us can acknowledge, yeah, even before I was a Christian, yeah, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. I get, in courts every day, people acknowledge they're sinners, right? But it doesn't get them saved. You go, yeah, I confess my sins, sure. Okay, how much time do I get? But I haven't become a Christian. Um, but we tell them to acknowledge their sin, and then we tell well, now you've got to repent of your sins. Well, but not feeling that sorry for my sins. And actually, interesting enough, when Simon the sorcerer did something, Peter said, maybe God will grant you repentance. The Bible says that repentance is by the Spirit of God, not by us. But we're telling people, come on, you got to repent. And then we tell people, now you got to forsake your sins. Well, I don't know about you, but before I was a Christian, I tried to forsake some of my sins, and I couldn't. I, in myself, I was not able to do it because I didn't have the help of the Holy Spirit. And yet we tell people, well, you got to repent of your sins, now forsake them in your own works. Oh, sounds like a dead work. Um, and now we've got to turn to Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And yet the Bible says the Holy Spirit has to first draw us. Um, so we're, we're told to acknowledge that we're sinners without the revelation of the Spirit of God, of what our sins really are about, why they grieve God. And then we're told to re, uh, um, repent of our sins without the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And then we're told to forsake our sins without the help of the Spirit of God. Then we're told to turn to Jesus without the Holy Spirit, without the Spirit of God. And so that makes our salvation become a work of the flesh. Okay? It's a work of my own flesh rather than the work of the Holy Spirit. And as John chapter 6, 63 says, the Spirit alone gives eternal life. Okay? Human effort, our flesh, accomplishes nothing. Now, what do you call it when you try to do something spiritual without the help of the Holy Spirit? It's called a dead work. Something I do by my own flesh rather than by the power of the Spirit of God. And so if we try to give people a little formula on how they have to go through this little process without involving the work of the Holy Spirit in each step, we've just taught them how to live in the flesh. We taught them how to embrace another dead work in their lives. And then we'll wonder why they're not passionate about their faith. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, let us go... And what are we supposed to do about dead works, okay? If we've just admitted that we've done a dead work by trying to convince someone to become a Christian without the work of the Holy Spirit in their life, what do we do with dead works? Therefore, let us go on to the perfection, not laying again the foundation of what? Repentance from dead works. We're using dead works to try to get people to become Christians, and the Bible says we're supposed to be repenting of those dead works. What are you supposed to do with dead works? Repent of them. <laughs> but don't I have to repent from my sins in order to be saved? Do I have to repent of my sins in order to be saved? Well, you know, it's interesting. I opened up my e-sword, my electronic computer Bible study software, and so I typed in the words, repent, sin, saved. No verses at all. There isn't a single verse in the Bible that says you must repent of your sins in order to be saved. There isn't one. And then I remembered, as I was saying before, before I was a Christian, I repented all the time, but I didn't get saved. I was always feeling bad for my sins, but I didn't get saved. People are repenting every day. December 31st, a lot of people do a lot of repenting and making new, new you know, making new, uh, what do you call them, New Year's resolutions. Nobody gets saved doing that. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say if I, about salvation, biblical salvation, okay? The Bible says repent and believe. Oh, okay, the word repent is in there, but let's look at this. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God 
saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and re believe in the gospel, which is the gospel of the kingdom. It's just said there right there, okay? So the, the way to get saved, okay, is repent and believe. Problem is, this verse doesn't tell us what to repent of. It just says you've got to repent of something. You've got to repent of something, but it doesn't tell us what it is there. And then it says we need to believe in the gospel of the kingdom, but doesn't tell us what the gospel of the kingdom is. So we have to do a little bit of study to figure out what that really means, okay? Well, let's look at this. First it says repent, so let's do that. Let's look at repent. What does an unbeliever need to repent of? What does an unbeliever need to repent of? Well, it didn't say repent of your sins. Yeah, so let's go a little bit further with this thought. What do you really need to repent of? I, I, I'm going to present to you today what I believe is the true thing we need to repent of. What we need to repent of is the lie that we got right back there in the Garden of Eden. What is that lie? Satan comes to Eve when, and he tempts her with the fruit of the tree. And so she says, I can't, can't eat that, I'm going to die. And, 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 and Satan says, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat the fruit of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Here's the lie in the garden, that you will be like God and you will know good and evil. Okay. So Satan's big lie, that not only Adam and Eve believe, but we, that every, almost every human being on the face of the earth today believes... The big lie is that we can all be God, we can all be like God, because we will know. Satan implied that we can be like God, we can be a God, for we will know. God, we, you will know, I will know. So Satan made it all about us, it's all going to be about you will know, and he made it all about what we believe to be true, you will know. He says it's going to be about you, and it's about, going to be what you believe to be true. And if you do that, you can be your own God. So the first thing Satan introduced, there's the you will know. That's the lie, you will know. The you, the false god of humanism. From that moment on, mankind began to exalt himself and follow his own desires. It became about us. It became about us. Second thing, you'll know the false god of rationalism from that moment on, truth became whatever we reasoned to be true, not what God said was true. And here we are, how many years after the Garden of Eden, when it's still all about us, what makes it, well, I just want to be happy, so I'm going to do this and this and this and this. I don't care what God says. I'm going to do this because I want to be happy. And this is what I believe to be true. This is what I've reasoned is true. There can only be one way to heaven because I've reasoned there must be many ways. God won't be ha unhappy with this because I've reasoned that this is acceptable. Even God said it's not. And the truth, two things, the lie from the Garden of Eden is, 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 the, is the twin lie of humanism and rationalism. Okay? And so all of our other sins today are really an outworking of these two sins. This one big lie, you will know, and the two false gods, humanism and rationalism. And so the only way to truly overcome the sin of our life is yes to repent. But not to repent of our sins, but to repent or renounce the big lie. The big lie. Because you can repent of all the sins you want in your life, but if you haven't renounced humanism and rationalism, you're going to struggle as a Christian your whole life. This is the real issue, humanism and rationalism. So let's uh, look at this a little bit more. There we go. So we need to renounce Satan's lie. What do we say that lie was? Self-focused living, humanism, and human rationalization. See, it's interesting. In the first century... When a person wanted to become a Christian, it says, you know, the Bible says that within one hour of their salvation, they went through the waters of baptism. They didn't wait till they were old enough, mature enough, spiritual enough. Within one hour of their, of their initial 
um, encounter with the truth of God's word. They went through water baptism. And at that water baptism, they were asked three questions. First century, three questions. Every, every new believer was asked three questions. First question was, do you renounce Satan? Second question, do you renounce all of his works? And third question was, do you renounce all of his promises? Every new believer in the first century was asked that question. And you had to say, yes, I so do renounce. The process of salvation has to begin, not with just feeling sorry for our sins. It has to begin, because we all feel sorry for the stuff we do, don't we? Like, like, the process of salvation begins when we renounce Satan's big lie. We renounce Satan's big promise, self-focused living and human rationalization. I have to confess my independent living and thinking, and I need to turn back to God's original intention, which was total dependence on him. That's what we need to do in our salvation prayers. We have to declare dependence on God. Number one, here we go, dependent living. We have to declare dependence on two things. Number one, dependence on dependent living, living in intimacy with God. Galatians 5.25, if we live by in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, a daily dependence on God and on being led by His Spirit. And so every day I rise up in the morning and, and I endeavor to, to, to enter into and renew my intimate relationship with the Father and with His Holy Spirit and try to live throughout the day in communion with the Holy Spirit. And so therefore my life becomes about God and me, not just about me. All right, that was lie number one, the humanism. Every day I get up and I say I'm going to be dependent on my intimacy with God and it's all about God and me, not just about me. The second thing I have to be doing is dependent overcoming, overcoming my flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I, um, there's another verse here. There it is. John 6, 63, it is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh, prophets, zippo, nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And so I overcome by not only getting up and renewing my intimacy with the Father so it's no longer just about me, it's about God in me. And then I live in the power of the Spirit by obeying His Word. The words I speak to you are spirit in their life. So I'm not battling using the strength of my own flesh or my own reasoning, but instead, well, because the efforts of the, the flesh produce nothing, including my reasoning, but instead I live each day and walk each day and overcome each day by the Spirit and the words that are words of life to me which overcomes the second lie, human rationality. Instead, I live by the Spirit and the words that he's inspired. Okay? So the first step of salvation is indeed repentance, but it's not repentance of our sins. It's repentance of the big lie that would make life all about us and our own rational thinking. I know so many Christians today that are struggling because they still think it's all about them and they still think it's all about their own human logic. I can't logically explain much of what happens in my life today, but thank God, God is a loving Heavenly Father and He leads me and guides me and, 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 and provides for me. Um, we tr man, man, we gotta repent of the big lie. Bible says repent and believe. The second thing we got to do is believe. And the Bible says we have to believe in what? In the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. We have to repent and believe the gospel of the kingdom. But again, what is the gospel of the kingdom? Well, here's a verse about the kingdom, Matthew 4, 23. Jesus went all about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Jesus didn't preach the gospel of salvation. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. 
Again, the gospel of salvation becomes all about me, doesn't it? The gospel of salvation is I need to get saved. I want to get saved. I want to enjoy salvation. The gospel of the kingdom is so much bigger than me. The gospel of the kingdom is about the king, not about me. Oh, that goes against line number one again, doesn't it? Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Not the gospel of salvation, but the gospel of the kingdom we preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Okay? So God wants the gospel of the kingdom to be preached everywhere. Now, just a side point. Um, if, if this verse is saying that if the end will not come until the gospel of the kingdom has been preached in the whole world... And if we really do want Jesus to come again, then maybe we'd better start preaching the gospel of the kingdom than whatever gospel on earth we've been preaching up to this point. Because Jesus didn't say, when the gospel of salvation has been fully preached, I'm coming. He says, when the gospel of the kingdom has been preached, then the end will come. So if I really want Jesus to come, instead of just saying, oh, Jesus, please come, please come, please come, why don't I start sharing the gospel of the kingdom? Well, what difference is that going to make? Well, I'll tell you what difference is going to make. 2 Peter 3, 11 and 12. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and, radical theology, speed its coming. You can speed the coming of Jesus. We can actually speed up the coming of Jesus. As this verse is saying, I don't know when Jesus is coming, but on the authority of God's word, I can speed it up. How? By preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Because as soon as the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, then the end will come. Well, the gospel's all been preached the whole world. No, it hasn't. There are over 10,000 people groups on the face of this earth that have not yet heard the gospel. 10,000. When those 10,000 have heard the gospel on the authority of God's word, then... Jesus will come. But not until we preach the gospel of the kingdom. That was just an aside, but anyway. Okay, so what is the gospel of the kingdom? Okay, what is the gospel of the kingdom? Well, the kingdom, I, I, like, <laughs> I'm kind of simple. You know, I'm not deep or profound. I'm kind of simple. And for me, the gospel, if, there, if there's a kingdom, do we understand that there's a king, there has to be a king, there has to be a king? There's no kingdom without a king. So there's a kingdom has a king who, sh who needs to be obeyed. Okay? See, first, we, the, if we're going to believe on the gospel of the kingdom, the first thing we have to do is believe that there's a king who has to be, be, be uh, obeyed. And so first thing we need to do is decide who's going to be on the throne of our lives. Is it going to be me or is it going to be King Jesus? That's a biggie. They, Jesus didn't say, invite me into the sphere of your life and sit on some sort of chair somewhere in your circle of influence or whatever. He said, come and enthrone me on your heart. Jesus doesn't want to sit at the table. He wants to sit in your seat. Okay. He doesn't want to sit in the living room, even if you give them a nice recliner with the vibrator in the corner, he's not going to be happy there. He wants to sit in your seat. He wants to sit in your throne. There's a king that needs to be enthroned. That's the gospel of kingdom. There's a king who has to be enthroned. The king has a kingdom has a king. And if they're, and it, folks, if we're desperately honest or honestly desperate or something, we're going to have to admit that we desperately need King Jesus on our, the throne of our lives. Because okay? we are doing a royal job messing up our own lives. Okay? So the first thing we need to do if we believe the gospel of the kingdom is we need to step off the throne of our lives and put Jesus firmly on the throne of our lives. The second thing, Okay, we've talked about that. Decide who's going to be on your throne. Second thing we have to do is confess Jesus as king. 
Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. See, Bible, salvation doesn't come from confessing your sins. It says it comes from confessing that Jesus is Lord. Big difference, right? Big difference. That he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. The good news is that since Jesus has already died for the sins of the whole world. See, here's the thing. We're running around confessing the sins of of our lives, and the and, and Bible says, no, no, confess that Jesus is Lord. See, because Jesus has, all, what does the Bible say? Jesus has already died once for all time for all sins, right? So when we confess Jesus is Lord, we get the benefit of him, his lordship, the benefit of him being King Jesus, which is our sins are automatically forgiven. We don't have to confess our sins. We just have to confess Jesus is Lord because when we confess that Jesus is Lord and we embrace the king, we get the benefits of his kingdom, which is full, full salvation, full forgiveness. Forgiveness is automatically granted to anyone who becomes a citizen of his kingdom. Third thing, trust in Jesus as king. Recognize he's king, confess him as king, and trust in him as king. Acts chapter 16, 30, 31. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This was the, uh, uh, the jailer, the, uh, what city was that? Was that Philippi? Jailer Philippi, I think. Anyway, he, jailer, uh, um, big, big um, earthquake, all the jail doors open up, and uh, here's the poor jailer going, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. What must I do to be saved? And Peter and... Are you right? I'm so, oh, you're so good. It is. It's Paul and Silas. Thank you. You're, it was definitely Paul and Silas. What did they reply? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. It was the Philippian, yeah, Philippian jailer. But it was Paul and Silas. And they told him, believe in the Lord Jesus. Interesting again. They didn't say believe in the, in the tender shepherd Jesus. Well, they didn't, they didn't. Didn't say believe in the friend of sinners Jesus. Didn't say believe in the great teacher Jesus. Didn't, don't believe in the master Jesus. Don't believe in the lover of your souls Jesus. But instead, believe in, put your trust in of the Lord Jesus. How do you get saved? Recognize that Jesus is Lord and trust in him as Lord. That's a big difference between repenting your sins and asking Jesus to come somehow into your life and have a nice buddy friendship with him. I, 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 I oh, hobby horse time, sorry. <laughs> I, there's a song, I love the song, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. It's a beautiful song, but the problem is a lot of Christians aren't friends of God. When we look in the Bible, it says that Moses was a friend of God because God talked to him face to face. And Jesus took his 12 disciples who he trained as apostles and spent three and a half years every day with, and at, the end, at three and a, at the end of the three and a half years, he sat those 12 together. And he says, you know what? I no longer call you my disciples. I call you my friends. And we find this wonderful verse in the Bible and say, that's my verse. Jesus is my friend too. I don't do what he says. I very seldom even think of him. I don't pray. I don't read his word. But I'm going to claim that verse. We're, we're deceiving Christians into believing they're having something they don't yet have. Can a Christian be a friend of God? Oh, yeah, they can. It's a wonderful experience. But man, it takes commitment. It takes an abandonment of our lives. It takes us pursuing the Lord every day and said, I want to walk with you like Adam walked with you in the garden. And if I do that, yeah, I'm going to become friend of God. But for right now, I, I first need you to be my Lord. I need you to be my king. I need to trust in you as my king. The friendship follows. It doesn't start there. Third part, 
of this believing in the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom ha has an envoy, I don't know what other word to use, has an envoy to be received. I want to look at Apostle Peter's first altar call. Acts 2, verses 37, 38. When the people heard this, they were uh, what Peter was saying about how they crucified Jesus, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of... We know what the repent is. Repent of the big lie. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, the, of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Very quickly, print, repent. We already talked about repent of the big lie. Be water baptized. Yes, go through the waters of baptism. That's baptism that symbolized that washing of your sins away. That you publicly declare, yes, I make a commitment for the Lord. And I'm publicly going through a symbolic act of going through the same death, burial, and resurrection that Jesus went through. I'm identifying with my Lord Jesus Christ. But then he says, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazed? amazing? Peter didn't say, repent, be baptized, and you'll get to go to heaven someday. He said, repent and be baptized, and you'll get the gift, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Receiving the Holy Spirit has to be part of, of our salvation experience. Otherwise, we're back to dead works. Otherwise, our whole Christian life is an experience of legalistic dead works that profit nothing. And yet, how many times has someone presented the gospel and never even mentioned the Holy Spirit? Never mentioned the fact that, just to let you know, you will not survive a minute as a Christian without receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is central to the message of the church, but the process of salvation has to include the message and the gift and the experience of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is central to our salvation experience. And what happens when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, the kingdom has a power to live by. The Holy Spirit will bear witness with our spirit. Romans 8, 16. Well, as soon as the Spirit comes, He Himself will testify with our spirit that we are God's children. The Bible doesn't tell us to get people to say the sinner's prayer and try to convince them they become a Christian. I, I look at so many uh, presentations of the gospel. I said, lesson number one, how to get saved. Lesson number two, how to be sure you're a Christian. Folks, the Spirit will do that. If we have to spend hours trying to convince someone they become a Christian, there's a good chance they haven't. Because it's something the Holy Spirit does. Just messing with you. <laughs> Just say... Welcome the Holy Spirit in your life and then let the Holy Spirit testify to their spirits. Man, I remember when I became a Christian, I, I, I was just transformed on the inside. I, I knew there'd been a change. No one had to convince me there was a change. I knew there was a change. And people actually came to me and said, what's, what's happened to you? Why are you? What happened that you're so different? I said, I don't have a clue. I, don't, I haven't understood yet what just happened to me, but I've changed. I'm completely different. Holy Spirit will bear witness with our spirit. Second thing that will happen, the Holy Spirit will cleanse us. See, then we can benefit this wonderful verse that was written to Christians. So we try to use this verse on the unsaved. We say, well, if you confess your sins... God is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and purify you from all unrighteousness. Just confess your sins. No, that's not. Uh, but the, if the unsaved confess their sins, they just feel more miserable because now they had to admit their sins. There's no Holy Spirit within them to cleanse them yet. But once you become a Christian, you can claim the Christian verse that if we as believers confess our sins, then yes, God is faithful and just by the Holy Spirit to not only forgive us for those new sins we've committed as a Christian, but to immediately start to purify us from that ucky unrighteousness. 
Holy Spirit will cleanse you. And one last thing, the Holy Spirit will empower you. Galatians 5.16, I say then walk in the Spirit. And if we just walk in the Spirit, if we just let the Spirit empower our daily living, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. No dead work there. It's all by the Holy Spirit. Not, come on, try harder. Come on, just use a little bit more willpower and you can overcome that thing. No, just try walking in by the Spirit. So where, where on earth have we... Oh, hey, oh, look at another verse. I went the wrong way, sorry. Pushing too many buttons. One more time. There we go. So where have we gone wrong? Where, where, and I'm not saying this because I'm trying to mess everybody up with a new revelation. Like that, I, I don't need another new revelation. I, I'm having enough trouble trying to live out the ones I already have, right? Probably the same with you. But, folks, we, there was a period of time, and I was really, I'm really uncomfortable, I'm really burdened, I'm really concerned about the gospel presentations I've been hearing. Well, just sit there and just receive the love of Jesus. Did you feel something? Fantastic. You've got the Holy Spirit now. No, you just had some sort of chemical re reaction, or who knows what you had. <laughs> or, or just confess your sins and ask Jesus to forgive your sins, and you can be a Christian. Well, Jesus has already forgiven your sins when he died on the cross. So simply confessing your sins doesn't do anything other than make you feel worse than you were before you had to admit you had some sins. What have, we, what have we done? Why have, how have we gone wrong? How have we gone wrong here is um, we have told people to simply say the sinner's prayer, confess their sins, ask for forgiveness, and get forgiven so one day they can go to heaven. Well, I did it again. <laughs> Don't change your king. Keep your own king. It's okay. Jesus just wants to make you feel better. Keep your own king. Let, let, you can still be on your throne. It's okay. No, no, it's not okay. Where have we gone wrong? We're not challenging people to change their king. We're not challenging people to renounce Satan's big lie that's all about you and it's all about your own rationality. And we're not challenging people to welcome the Holy Spirit, which is the one that will convict you, give you the ability to repent, give you the real ability to renounce, and to give you the ability to live the Christian life. That's where we've gone wrong. So what do we need to do? Biblical salvation, what do we need to do? Mark 1.15, repent, what, of the big lie, and believe in the gospel of the kingdom. What does that look like? Number one, I repent for trying to be the king and lord of my own life and I live separate, and, and live separate from God in my own way of thinking. I've got to repent of that. For trying to be the king and lord of my own life and live separate from God in my own way of thinking, my own way of reasoning. Number two, I've got to repent for trying to live my life through dead works, works which do not have the help of the Holy Spirit, which is why some of us are miserable all the time. <laughs> and I got to repent and renounce Satan's big lie and all of his works and all of his promises. Then once I've repented, then I can believe. I believe and confess with my mouth that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords and that God raised him from the dead so that I could have a new king. I believe and receive Jesus as the new Lord and King in my life and the Savior of all my sins. And then I believe and receive the Holy Spirit into my life to rescue and empower me and to restore me to intimacy with my Heavenly Father so that now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, I can begin to live a brand new life. That's repenting and believing, folks. So we're going to... Oh, look at that. We're going to... I pushed the red button too much, and I'm wearing out my batteries. I think what's happening here. Okay, let's stand to our feet.
In a moment, in a little while, we're going to pray for whatever your needs are again. As I said, we'll be having a prayer time at the end of every service. If you want fellowship, you want refreshments, you probably saw and smelt on your way through <laughs> the offering there, you can go to the uh, fellowship area and, re- and uh, have a snack and fellowship. But we're going to turn this into a prayer room in a minute for whatever your needs are. We have a ministry team ready. But first, let's make sure we're on the same page. Let's make sure we really have done gone through biblical salvation, okay? So let's, uh, actually, I'll even go back. Let's do it this way. So together, let's declare truth by truth and make sure we're on on the kingdom side of salvation, okay? Number one, ready? Together, I repent for trying to be the king and lord of my own life and live separate from God in my own way of thinking. I'll just take a moment and let that sink in. Yes, Lord. Number two, I repent for trying to live my life through dead works, works which do not have the help of the Holy Spirit. And just think about that for a minute. Even this last week, Number three, I repent and renounce Satan and all of his works and all of his promises. Yes, Lord. Number four. I believe and confess with my mouth that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords and that God raised him from the dead so that I could have a new king. Number five. I believe and receive Jesus as the new Lord and King of my life and Savior of all my sins. Let that sink in right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, King Jesus. And number six, I believe and receive the Holy Spirit into my life to rescue and empower me and to restore to me the intimacy with my Father, the Father. Now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, I can begin to live a brand new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just make sure you receive him. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We receive you into our lives today. Afresh if need be, but we receive you today. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's biblical salvation. And that's the type of salvation God wants us to offer to everyone we meet so they can experience the full benefits of salvation. And that's the salvation God wants to make sure that we embrace so that we can live by the full benefits of salvation.